Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Hello and welcome to episode 26. This time we take a trip to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in search of new species and encounter a distinctly old one. It's the Maricot Deep, and here's Paul with the introduction. Curiosity surrounds the latest plans of scientific maverick Professor Maricot, who is organising an exploratory voyage to the Atlantic Ocean to investigate a deep-sea trench which has been christened the Maricot Deep. When his ship, the Stratford, arrives over the trench, Maricott and two companions, fellow scientist Cyrus Headley and Bill Scanlon, an American engineer, descend into the ocean in a specially constructed submersible chamber. Unfortunately, an unexpected encounter with a gigantic sea creature cuts the submersible loose from the Stratford and it sinks to the bottom of the abyss. As the three explorers prepare for death in the illimitable depths, they see a human face looking in on them. The Maricot Deep was Conan Doyle's last novel, uh, written in two parts over the period 1927 to 1929. Uh, the first part was written shortly after Conan Doyle had just completed the last Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place, which appeared in The Strand in April 1927. And it was just as that story was being published that Conan Doyle was in correspondence with John Austin, a, a reporter at the Weekly Dispatch, who asked him about uh, whether or not there'd be any more Sherlock Holmes or indeed any more literary work forthcoming. And in his reply, Conan Doyle gave the very first recorded reference to what would become the Maricot Deep. He said, I fear there's little chance of my doing much more literary work with a correspondence of 30 or 40 letters a day, dealing often with abstruse cases and with constant demands. My time is much busier. I was glad to withdraw Holmes before the public was too weary of him. I have a story, the Fabricius Deep, in my mind, which no doubt will reach the Strand magazine in time, but how long it will take, I don't yet know. Now, Conan Doyle said in that letter that this was just an idea in his head, and that letter's dated 24th of April, 1927, but we know from the Gibson and Green bibliography that the manuscript was actually completed by May, Uh, so it took no more than five weeks to write And there's a letter from Conan Doyle to Lacon Watson, who was presumably the author and not the cricketer, although conceivably it could be the latter, um, in which he said, I've just done a small 30,000 worder, the Fabricius Deep, which no doubt will appear in the Strand. It was a big idea, too big for me to adequately handle. We don't know when or why the title changed to uh, the Maricot Deep, but we do know that while he was writing the story, he was helped from two sources – Uh, One of them was Lewis Spence, who was a a writer of sort of pseudo-historical volumes on Atlantis. And and the other was his daughter, Jean, uh, who had mumps at the time. And Conan Doyle gave her an encyclopedia and uh, a list of fish and asked her to write out a series of notes for him. Conan Doyle then submitted the story to The Strand. And it's worth putting into context that at this time, The Strand was suffering from a decline in fortunes. Um, and it went somewhat overboard in its advertising pitch. Uh, the adverts claim that the Maricot Deep is even more thrilling and exciting than Conan Doyle's masterpiece, The Lost World. The editor of The Strand magazine considers this Conan Doyle's finest story. It is undoubtedly the greatest sensation in magazine serials ever known, which is um, pretty pretty good hyperbole there. Conan Doyle wasn't actually that impressed with the advertising, and he wrote a letter to Greenhouse Smith while completing the Maricot Deep, saying, um, I do very much object to this style of advertisement. It's all wrong from the author's point of view. It's not for author or publisher, but for the critic to pronounce upon the merits of a book. And uh, that fits into a long tradition of Conan Doyle being 
quite unhappy with publicity-seeking authors like uh, Hall Kane and others. The first part of the story was serialised in the Strand magazine between October 1927 and January 1928 with some very striking illustrations from uh, Tom Petty who uh, managed to produce a, a look for the story which is remarkably like Buster Crabbe's Flash Gordon serials of almost 10 years later. Um, and it was published at the same time in the USA in the Saturday Evening Post. And that might have been the end of it, but Conan Doyle decided that he would revisit the topic and the settings and the characters almost two years later with a two-chapter addendum entitled The Lord of the Dark Face, which appeared in The Strand in April and May 1929, again with illustrations by Tom Petty. The additional chapters weren't published by the Saturday Evening Press. Um, but the, the the complete novel of seven chapters then appeared in The Maricot Deep and Other Stories, which was published by John Murray in 1929. And it's a very odd collection in that it has, in addition to Maricot Deep, it has the last two Professor Challenger stories and then the story of Spedigue's Dropper, a story of cricket. And the story was actually very well received. Uh, on its first On the serialisation of the first part, the Edinburgh Evening News said that it was attracting much attention. Uh, but if you look at the book reviews, they're sort of complementary while also suggesting that this is maybe a, a type of storytelling for an earlier time. You get the suggestion from uh, the Civil and Military Gazette writing in December 1929. They regard the story as being Wellesian in character, reference to H.G. Wells, of course. And then uh, the Daily News also say that... Uh, Maricot is perhaps cut to a pattern that was more nearly in fashion when Professor Challenger discovered the lost world. And then there's the final clinching um, backhanded compliment that the Maricot Deep is more suited to schoolboys than grown-ups. Yes, you you raised some interesting points there, Mark. Um, one of them is that uh, about Conan Doyle's working methods. This this idea that he got his daughter Jean uh, to to look up the, uh, the to look up fish types in the encyclopedia, and this this goes back to um, when he was writing um, the doings of Raffles Hall, which we discussed in episode one, uh, way way back in eighteen ninety one, when when he got his young brother Innis to look up atomic weights for him as yes. part of the researcher's book. So he's again still using uh, <laughs> using youthful uh, youthful employment to help him. Um, th there's also the interesting fact that you, you mentioned the Lost World there, and, and obviously a lot of the critics referred to the Lost World. And, and the Maricot Deep did have a subtitle, The Lost World Under the Sea, mm. um, which does make you think, is this a, a challenger story without challenger? Yeah. Um, and in, in many ways it is. When you look at the characters, um, Maricot is, 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 is the physical opposite to Challenger. He's a bit of a stick, um, described at least a couple of times as, 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 as like a mummy. Mm. Um, so he's more physically like Summerlee mm. from the Challenger team. So he's a mix of Summerlee and Challenger, really, with his, his, his egotism and his, his uh, I'm not wrong attitude. Um, and then you, you've got um, Cyrus Headley is very much the, the, uh, the Ed Malone character yeah. for this, chronicling it. Um, and then instead of the big game hunter, Blood John Roxton, you've got this, this kind of fisticuffs American engineer Bill Scanlon so it, it is in many ways the same sort of team yeah you have to ask the question why he didn't use Challenger um, because mm. they are so close and I I do wonder if it's got something to do with the the spiritualist elements of it I mean the last time we'd seen Challenger um, had been in the land of mist in which mm. he famously was converted to spiritualism at the end but the next two Challenger stories the ones that were um, uh, collected with the Maricot Deep for that uh, John Murray edition are set actually before the Land of Mist and also there's no reference to spiritualism in, in them at all so um, there might be a sense in which he wants to new, use new characters specifically to explore the more spiritualist element of the Maricot Deep and that's why he goes with a new crew as it were the, the other thing that strikes me about the um, the team is that you introduce Scanlon as an American figure. And I think that's a that's a sort of recognition of the fact that times are changing. This is the post-war era. There's much more of an American influence in a whole range of different ways on British society and culture and literature. Mm -hmm. And um, Scanlon is, uh, you know, a huge, incredibly stereotypical character. <laughs> um, but there's a sense in which, you know, he almost reflects the characters that 
would have been in front of everybody, the sort of characters that you would have seen on the on on the movie screen. But he does have this quite appalling um, patois, um, including G. Willikers and things like mm. that, which uh, make him quite grating to read. Mm. I think. Well, there's one point, isn't there, where he he he. he... It's, it's almost like Doyle setting this story in, in a very contemporary world because you have Scanlon referring to Prohibition Hooch. Yes. And the, the, the other thing is, as well with the, with the, the Challenger stories that go in, in the Maricot Deep collection, uh, it, it is it, it, the fact that we don't have the spiritualist reference, that they do seem to be set before the Land of Mist. Is, mm. is, it, it is almost like a Hound of the Baskervilles moment. Yeah. I'd like to write about these characters more, but I can't carry them on from the Land of Mist. So... I have to go back. Yeah, yeah. And w- when we get to the Lord of the Dark Face later, we almost get that in a slightly different way here in that he decides he's going to revisit those characters for the last part, but actually sets it again earlier. Chronologically, he has to set yes. um, the story uh, sort of midway through the Maricot Deep, which creates all sorts of mm. continuity errors. And But um, I think you're right. He sort of decides he's going to go back and do some more with the same characters. Another way in which it, it I think it feels contemporary is that, is that it echoes a lot of the sort of pulp science fiction that you were starting to see around the, the 1920s. I mean, Hugo Gernsback's um, Amazing Stories came out in 1926, and that did an awful lot for sort of consolidating in the public imagination um, what science fiction uh, was. Um, but actually, science fiction as a genre had gone back centuries. Um, it was, you know, there were no fixed boundaries around it. Um, and uh, and and in a way, this is a peculiar story in that it looks forward, particularly Lord of the Dark Face, looks forward to sort of pulp science fiction. Um, but there's a really strong element th- of this, which is looking all the way back to the great founders of um, science fiction uh, and people like um, Verne and Wells uh, and arguably Poe, who were uh, pivotal to the evolution of that genre. Yes, Verne in particular um is is a really strong influence on the maricot deep um and and his um 20,000 leagues under the sea or to translate it correctly 20,000 leagues under the seas mm. it was originally published in french as as vingt milieu sous les mers in 1870 and translated as 20,000 leagues under the seas in 1871 um Conan Doyle himself, we know, read this book when he was at Stonyhurst in 1873. It was in the original French um, because he reports to his mother in a letter in June 1873 that he has read Vingt Milieu C'est les Mers by Jules Verne. So he was definitely familiar with this story and he probably read it a number of times throughout his life, I would think, yes. um, because its influence just seems so strong. Although Twenty Thousand Leagues is really uh, it's it's a, it's a voyage of exploration round the world, and and it's it's a like with so much of Jules Verne's work, it's it's it has a didactic element. Mm. He sees it as his role to to teach you science as well as give you an adventure story, and sometimes the the didactic and political <laughs> elements of, of Verne's work overtake the yes. adventure story element. Um, but nevertheless, where you, you do have this adventure story, it, it's wonderful stuff. And, and Verne does build up this 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 undersea world very, very well. Um, and you can definitely see that going very strongly into, into the Maricot Deep. But what Verne does is, is he does try and keep this level of science and, and real creatures. Whereas Conan Doyle, of course, as in The Lost World, he has to have monsters in it. He has to have these things yes. that go just a step beyond the boundaries of science, that little bit, um, but still remain within the, the, the borders of, of believability. But it's because Doyle sees the, the adventure story as the, 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 the first and foremost uh, of what he's trying to do. Um, yeah. He does, as we will discuss later with the kind of spiritualistic elements, there is an element of, of polemicism and didacticism creeps in, yeah. but nevertheless. The scientific uh, verisimilitude was something that Verne credited Poe with. Um, Verne, I think, only wrote one article in his life about his writing, um, but he actually mm. credited Poe with being the, the great influence on that, that aspect. And Poe did write things that we would call sort of proto-science fiction, um, which have that kind of strong scientific element as well. And, uh, and Verne actually did write um, a, a sequel or a continuation of Poe's uh, narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of, of Nantucket. Yes, yeah, which we, we mentioned in um, episode three on Captain of the Polestar. Mm. And the, the, so you've got Verne 
with his sort of scientific uh, scientific realism. And then you have the other great influence at this time, I think, is is obviously H.G. Wells. Mm-hmm. And Wells is slightly less interested, I think, in the scientific reality, and he's more <laughs> interested in the consequences of the science and the consequences on, on people and, and society more broadly. And, uh, and he himself wrote a, a story which could also be seen as a possible influence, which is In the Abyss, um, a short story from 1896 about a scientist who um, descends to the bottom of the ocean um, and uh, uh, when he is brought back to the surface, um, he he mentions that he saw a, a human-like civilization. But then he says, I, I didn't have any contact with them. <laughs> and and it's uh, and Maricot Deep almost feels like Conan Doyle has, has read that story and decided, I'm going to do the bit that H.G. Wells left out, <laughs> which is which is all the interesting stuff when they actually go to meet the people, find out what's <laughs> happening and before they come back. But uh, it is it is fascinating that you've got Conan Doyle sits right on that boundary between the scientific reality and the sort of great fantastical element of it because I think in in part what he's doing there is making a point about the limits of science again which you've seen repeatedly through his writing. One of the things that's quite striking about um, the Maricot Deep is how much he's prepared to uh, work with um, the scientific reality and then just dismiss it completely. Mm. So you end up with statements like um, uh, the water pressure. Classically, he talks about mm-hmm. how um, Maricot says, uh, you know, everybody's predicting that we're going to be crushed by the water pressure. But actually, mm-hmm. after a certain amount, you don't <laughs> you don't experience <laughs> it in quite the same way. And then later, we discover that the Atlanteans have got have split the atom. But um, there's a reference to the fact that there, there was there wasn't as much energy within the atom <laughs> as scientists had predicted. So there's again there's this age old theme we keep coming back to of Conan Doyle saying you know the limits of scientific knowledge or don't trust the orthodoxy of science because actually um, there are other things there are things that we don't yet understand we can't yet explain and 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 therefore some of the things that we think to be true now may not in fact be true. And and Verne's purpose how oh, that part purpose being being didactic he, he he actually wants to show us the natural world under the sea and discuss the the the, the, the natural world under the sea whereas as conan doyle really again the, the real focus of of the maricot deep is 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 the discovery of atlantis and mm. humans under the sea and and the the kind of the the, the speculative imaginative side of the story um obviously the 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 legend of atlantis is age old um but it it had gained a a kind of new popularity again in the the early to mid 20th century um i mean one one of the the early examples with which conan Doyle was doubtless familiar uh was was a rather interminable serialized (laughs) novel um by cj cutcliffe hine uh, called the lost continent uh, which appeared in Pearson's magazine between July and December 1899, um, and basically it starts with with, a, with an archaeological discovery, and then we're swept back to Atlantis as it was above the above the waters, um, and and you've essentially got a, a, an ancient epic um, along the lines of of, of Ryder Haggard's Cleopatra and mm. that, that sort of book, um, but with this being a made up place. Cutcliffe Hine can play about with, we introduce a few monsters, that kind of thing, uh, as ever. But uh, it, it, it's not uh, an undersea Atlantis that we see in, in his novel. Um, but it, around the time, or just, just later than, than Conan Doyle uh, wrote The Maricot Deep, um, Dennis Wheatley, who would of course go on to fame as, as, as the occult novelist par excellence, uh, wrote a, an Atlantis novel, which again involves a submersible and, and going down... It, called They Found Atlantis. Uh, that came out in 1936. Um, there was another novel by Daphne Vigors, uh, which was published in 1944, Atlantis Rising. Um, 1951, a novel called The Eternal Echo, another an Atlantean love story um, by Phyllis Craddock, who went on to great, greater fame later on in the 1960s and 1970s as a, as a famous television chef, Fanny Craddock. Um, <laughs> And and as an aside, uh, in 1976, uh, she also wrote the Sherlock Holmes cookbook. <laughs> and uh, also, um, in in 1926, you've almost got um, an anti 
Atlantis, Atlantean novel um, or, or novella uh, in The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft, ah. uh, in which the, uh, the, the, the city of Rilliar, which is, has, has lain under the Pacific Ocean and is the home of Dread Cthulhu, rises to the surface of the ocean for a short while when there is a, is a, is a, a cataclysm beneath, beneath the waves and then sinks slowly back again. Mm, very nice. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Lovecraft on that because one of the other things that's going on alongside all this sort of splurge of literary activity and interest in Atlantis is this sort of pseudo-academic, pseudo-archaeological um, strand of, uh, of work where people are sort of piecing together this um, actually fictional lost history. But people like Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote a book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World in 1882. And um, that was the first work that really claimed Atlantis existed as a Bronze Age civilization, picking up on Plato and mm. early sources as well. And that's, you know, that's quite an influential work. You get that referenced an awful lot of times. But his ideas were principally picked up by in the 1920s by Lewis Spence, who I mentioned earlier. And Spence wrote two of these pseudo-historical works, one of them called The Problem of Atlantis in 1924 and uh, The History of Atlantis in 1927. And Conan Doyle was apparently in communication with Lewis Spence and asked him some questions about Atlantis. And Spence himself wrote widely on mythology and folklore and uh, Druidism. I think he was associated as the chief Druid of um, Britain at one point um, in the 30s and 40s wrote on Nazi occultism um, and uh, aside from all of that he was also a Scottish nationalist and the founder of the Scottish National Movement which became the forerunner of the Scottish National Party and and it does make you wonder whether or not Conan Doyle was interested in Atlantis as a you know actually as a lost civilization as opposed to as something that he could uh, just treat with as a uh, as a story concept because he is in touch with spence and people who are you know apparently re apparently researching this this uh, uh lost civilization in all seriousness and uh, along those sort of lines in a strange sort of way uh another influence on on the maricot deep is 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 a book that we discussed in episode 14 on the terror of blue john gap uh, the Coming Race by mm. um, Bulwer Lytton, 1871, about a, a, a lost civilization under the earth rather than under the sea. But when you, you you go back to that book and you see the way that the civilization is set up in it, it is in many ways very similar to the civilization that, that, that Conan Doyle depicts in, in the Maricot Deep. Um, and, and it's interesting where you, you, you mention about the uh, Lewis Spence and his his interest in in, in politics uh, mm. as well in, in the, the coming race as we discussed before uh in a way almost started its own strange political world built around this this idea of of, of vril um so mm -hmm. these ideas all get get thrown together in this strange mix yeah and as well as those uh literary and cultural influences on the story we know that Conan Doyle was interested in the science too. And he mentions a couple of um, uh, explorers and pioneers in particular in the course of the story. So there's direct acknowledgement of probably the most famous of all of the oceanographic uh, expeditions, the Challenger expedition from 1872 to 1876, which was you know, the first um, systematic exploration of the oceans, um, covered something like 80,000 miles captured details of about 4,000 species. And um, the leader of that expedition was Charles Wyville Thompson, who actually became a faculty member at Edinburgh University while Conan Doyle was there. And in Memories and Adventures, he refers to um, there was Wyville Thompson, the zoologist fresh from his Challenger expedition. And in the course of the story, Headley has asked um, what he thinks the uh, Maricot expedition is going to accomplish. And he says, I suppose that we shall do what the Challenger and a dozen other exploring ships have done before us and add a few more species to the list of fish and a few more entries to the bathymetric chart, which is slightly dismissive. <laughs> and then there is this reference to the um, the device that they use to descend to the, to the bottom of the ocean, which is this peculiar, very Vernian, Nautilus-like um, Victorian living room complete with uh, sofa and table and other things like that. Um, uh, there's a reference to this this peculiar uh, submersible uh, as an extension of the experiment of the Williamson brothers of Nassau. And that's a reference to John Ernest Williamson, 
uh, who was a pioneer of, of undersea photography. And in 1914, he and his brother George had filmed um, the first underwater motion pictures uh, in a submarine chamber that they dubbed the Williamson Photosphere. And then the, the other possible source of influence is actually the bathysphere itself, this spherical diving bell, which is much more uh, akin to what um, H.G. Wells describes in the, in the Abyss. He describes a sort of nine foot in diameter spherical diving bell. But um, the term bathysphere comes from William Bebby and Otis Barton, who were building this device in 1928 and 1929. And uh, they first launched it in 1930 and it set record after record at the time submarines could only reach about 100 meters and they were uh, descending to almost a kilometer in 1934 Th- those records lasted for about 15 years so um conan doyle is is clearly aware of the technology and we know he's got an interest in submarines we picked up on that previously mm-hmm. as well but he's very much aware of this technology which is in development at the same time and and like a lot of science fiction, Maricot Deep looks like um, Conan Doyle is prophesying what, what's going to come to pass. But actually, what he's doing is picking up on a number of influences that everybody is exposed to and just putting those into words in the form of this, of this, uh, of this story. And another thing that places this really in the 1920s is, the, uh, is, is this connection to pulp science fiction. There's almost a sense in which Conan Doyle may have been thinking about changing his writing story, style or adapting his style for modern tastes, modern audiences. Um, Maricot Deep, and particularly The Lord of the Dark Faces, will come on to feel very much like pulp science fiction. They feel like the sort of things that could have been coming out of um, amazing stories. Um, And we know he did something similar with other parts of his fiction around this time. He wrote a short story called The Last Resource, which is a, a noir short story, and it almost feels like a pastiche of uh, Dashiell Hammett. And uh, indeed, some of the later Sherlock Holmes stories have that um, feeling of, of touching on topics that would previously have been unacceptable in the uh, the short stories of maybe the adventures or the memoirs, as we sort of as we covered last time with the the, the creeping man. And as as well as as discussing issues of contemporary science. Uh, Doyle also uses this novel in his own way to to discuss um, politics and societal issues. When the explorers come to Atlantis, they 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 they, they, they find this this well regimented society um, in in which all all the, uh, the the inhabitants have 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 raised their level of telepathy and, mm-hmm. and can communicate through telepathy and, and, and turn those thoughts into television and all, all these, these kind of ideas, mm-hmm. which are used for, for uh, political purposes and used at meetings and so on to, to, to make up their form of politics. Um, but you've also got this um, interesting mm-hmm. setup uh, 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 where the, the Atlanteans themselves are depicted as, 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 a, as a dark race uh, and, and, alongside them there's also a fair race which are presumably supposed to be descended from ancient greeks or something along those lines um but the the way um that that, that headley describes this he says that the, the workers were tall men fair with blue eyes and powerful bodies whereas the leaders were dark with squat broad frames uh, you've also got an element in this of, of, of perhaps being influenced by the Morlocks and the Eloy in, in uh, Wells's The Time Machine. But uh, you've also got to wonder, and this is, is, this is a time when, when Britain's role as an imperial power is, is, is it's still strong, but it's beginning to slip away. Yeah. And this, this, is this Conan Doyle worrying about, about reverse colonization or the, 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 the failure of Western empires? All these ideas are almost thrown into this novel, but they're never developed uh, to the level they, they could be. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a lot of this stuff in here. And I think um, this is an interesting insight into, I think, what Conan Doyle's views were in that immediate post-war period. And you've got a number of influences that come to bear in in the Maricot Deep. So on the one hand, you've got that crisis of imperialism that you've just mentioned. And while Conan Doyle was a firm supporter of of the imperial mission, it was very much for the sort of moral and social good that he felt would be bestowed on Mm. other cultures by expanding the British influence 
uh, over the globe. Um, but he was also very concerned about the sort of economic and commercial imperatives that were were um, always there in imperialism, but but actually he felt were over overtaking. Um, and you get an element of that right at the end of the Lost World with this reflection that you know this this the plateau will now be uh, uh, raped and pillaged by imperial economic forces um uh, but you also have his great concern of um bolshevism and uh bolshevik russia and social upheaval and that kind of change too and then a third thing which is you know what do we do with this technological and military and industrial might that has been so powerful and important during the first world war what do we do with that power and capability now and Conan was one of a number of writers, Wells included, um, who were really thought that all of that technological power needed to now be turned towards the sort of moral and social mission that they'd previously um, hoped empire was there to to fulfil. And um, and they even went so far as to talk about you know there needing to be um, a, a reconciliation between capital and labour. And Conan Doyle writes in the early 1920s about um, the need for cooperative movements or um, uh, profit sharing in a way that, you know, those themes are still (laughs) very current today. Um, But it's interesting, you know, as a figure, he's often thought of as being a Victorian out of time. Um, But some of his views in the 1920s are actually quite progressive uh, in, in their own way. And you get this reflected in the Maricot Deep. So when he tells the story of the fall of Atlantis, it's very much about the sort of avarice and the materialism of the people of Atlantis. Um, he observes the fall of Atlantis on one of these um, uh, telepathic television sets, as it were. <laughs> the description is, uh, there was no longer the quiet and simple family life, nor the cultivation of the mind, but we had a glimpse of a people who were restless and shallow, rushing from one pursuit to another, grasping ever at pleasure, forever missing it, and yet imagining always that in some more complex and unnatural form it might still be found. There had arisen on the one hand an over-rich class who sought only sensual gratification, and on the other hand an over-poor residue whose whole function in life was to minister to the wants of their masters, however evil those wants might be. And that's um, it's quite you know, in the middle of this very lightweight, pulpy sci-fi story, he's making quite a serious point there, which is actually about the structure of society. Mm, and and the, the following of false gods, which we'll come on to shortly. Mm. And as, as well as looking at modern or contemporary political cataclysm, there's, there's, there's plenty of reference throughout the Maricot Deep to, 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 to ancient mm. disaster um, in almost this comparison to cities like Sodom and Gomorrah and obviously the biblical flood. Mm. Um, but also the, there's a more, without actually mentioning Pompeii, he, he, he discusses ruined temples that the explorers find yeah. um, near Atlantis and, and discusses the, the obscene, also obscene pictures and carvings mm. On, on the walls of these temples. And, and it's interesting to, to, to think that has he got Pompeii in mind here and the cataclysm of Pompeii, because we, we, we know he visited Pompeii in, in 1907 on his uh, honeymoon with, with Jean Leckie. Mm. And the circumstances of the fall of Atlantis really are the sort of central element of um, the, the two-chapter addendum to the Maricot Deep, which was called uh, The Lord of the Dark Face. And this is really where all the spiritualist um, a content really starts to come to the fore. And right from the beginning of it, there's quite a big tonal shift uh, in, in, in the last two chapters. Um, quite a lot of the early part of Maricot Deep is interested in the, the glories and the wonders of um, the Undersea Kingdom. And there's definitely, um, there are definitely horrors in there. But um, most of the t- most of the time, the, the discussion is about how wonderful it is and the amazing um, technology that they have and the civilization that they have. Um, but when you start the Lord of the Dark Face, it, it's a much darker place. Um, you immediately get into some quite horrific uh, moments. I mean, the, the, it starts with this uh, list of uh, undersea creatures that Headley didn't have time to tell us about in the first in the first installments, as it were. Um, one creature is called the Praxa, which is a uh, greenish wisp-like cloud, luminous in the centre and ragged at the edges, uh, which the Atlanteans fear. Uh, 
and Maricott describes it as a, a new order of life, partly organic, partly gaseous, but clearly intelligent. Um, and Scanlon, of course, the American, describes it much more colorfully as a freak out of hell. Um, <laughs> and um, this, this wisp-like cloud descends on an Atlantean, and when they go to find him later, um, he's dead and his eyes have been torn out. I mean, it's pretty grim stuff. <laughs> and all of this is before they meet a much more horrifying and, and elemental force of evil, uh, which appears uh, in the last chapter, and that is the, the Lord of the Dark Face himself, who is this uh, ancient creature, um, humanoid in form, seven foot tall, who has been uh, uh, influencing human history um, uh, throughout, uh, uh, I think, 11,000 years or 12,000 years. Yes, this, this is um, the, the, the god Baal Sipa, as, mm. as Conan Doyle calls him. Um, uh, earlier in the novel, we, we do get mention of, of uh, the two dark gods of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, uh, Baal and Moloch. Um, and this, this, this is this is Baal we meet, but he's he's very much Baal as a, as a kind of Eastern demon uh, mm. in the Middle Ages was was co-opted into Western grimoires mm. to be become part of the part of the setup with the the kind of the Western view of 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 of, of hell and its its hierarchy. Um, but when we meet this this version of Baal, he, he's 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 more kind of. A, it's the guy at the top of the hierarchy, really. Mm. You know, he's, he's very, very Satan himself. And, and as you've mentioned, Mark, he, he talks about his role in history. And then mm. you get this, this kind of v- v- verbose <laughs> autobiography he gives the explorers. He said, I am the master of the mob. Where evil has been planned, there have I ever been. I was with the Huns when they laid half Europe in ruins. I was with the Saracens when, under the name of religion, they put to the sword all who gainsayed them. I was out on Bartholomew's night. I lay behind the slave trade. It was my whisper which burned ten thousand old crones whom the fools called witches. I was the tall, dark man who led the mob in Paris when the streets swam in blood. Rare times those, but they have been even better of late in Russia. That is whence I have come. So again, we're getting this this modern political, mm. this this uh, Doyle's uh, anti-Bolshevik message coming out here. Mm. Um, I have to say, when I when I first read that sequence, I was very much put in mind of uh, sympathy for the devil by the Rolling Stones. <laughs> this, this this history of this this character, um, and and uh, talking of of, of of matters like uh, like uh, rock music and so on um, you, it's again this 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 contemporary feel that the Conador constantly gives the Maricot deep um, th- there's an element of that when he describes uh, Baal or Baal Sipa as, as 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 he appears in Atlantis outwardly he was a magnificent creature not less than seven feet in height and built upon the lines of a perfect athlete which was the more noticeable as he wore a costume which fitted tightly upon his figure and seemed to consist of black glazed leather. I mean, this is almost a character who could, could walk straight out of, of, of some bizarre Berlin nightclub in, 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 in the Weimar years. <laughs> or, or, indeed, or indeed out of Doctor Who. You know, they, they did Atlantis three times and each time it was different. Um, but the, one of the occasions, there's, a, there's an ancient demon uh, called Azal who... Uh, <laughs> who is proudly boasts to uh, to John Pertwee's doctor that um you know he's been influencing human history uh, industrial revolution and all these different things and he basically says you know you will behave but otherwise the same fate will befall you as befell Atlantis <laughs> it's 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 interesting as well how in that list Conan Doyle picks out the um the, the persecution of the witches yeah uh, because at this this point um, he's very much involved in legal disputes uh, over over the, the 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 what he sees as the legal persecution of, of spiritualist mediums, um, and one of the, um, the, the the weapons that, that the authorities were using against mediums was the uh, the Witchcraft Act of seventeen thirty six, yeah. and there's an echo of that prosecution of mediums to some extent in. Conan Doyle's description of the survival of Atlantis in the Maricot Deep as well. Uh, he talks about the role of visionaries and reformers. So at one point he says that um, when he's talking about the, the, the fall of Atlantis, he says um, uh, a, a new note was struck. There were reformers at work 
who were trying to turn the nation from its evil ways and to direct it back into those higher paths which it had forsaken. We saw them grave and earnest men, reasoning and pleading with the people, but we saw them scorned and jeered at by those whom they were trying to save. But of course, these are the people who essentially build this ark and um, everybody survives on the back of their their solo efforts in the face of all of this um, criticism from uh, uh, from the rest of society. So, you know, he's very much on the side of the uh, um, uh, of these visionaries and reformers. And the name, the Lord of the Dark Face, comes straight out of Theosophy and the writings of Madame Blavatsky, specifically um, the Secret Doctrine, which was her sort of core text and came out in 1888. And we know that Conan Doyle read this uh, book. Uh, when it when it was released and in the secret doctrine Blavatsky uh, refers to the lords of the dark face as evil sorcerers of the Atlantean period um, who were destroyed by the lords of the dazzling face who were adepts of white magic um, and uh, the lords of the fires who were gnomes and fire elementals and they said that uh, only the blood of a pure man could destroy uh, an evil sorcerer of this kind so it's amazing that you know Conan Doyle read this stuff back in the 1880s and here he is 40 years later riffing off things that he he read in passing you know um and uh, it just goes to show how uh, how much of an impression the 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 works of Blavatsky and and Theosophy actually did have on uh, Conan Doyle. Yeah, yes, he, he, he read Blavatsky's work uh, in the 1880s and retained an interest uh, in theosophy. And he actually uh, stayed uh, friendly with, with one of Blavatsky's close associates, A.P. Sinnott, um, until Sinnott's death in, in the 1920s. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. And and I think the, the other thing, way in which you see sort of theosophy coming through in this is that Maricot suddenly acquires knowledge of comparative religions <laughs> just because he, yeah, needs, which, he needs to know it at the time for the plot. It, um, it is one of the, the, those left field moments mm-hmm. in the book where, where it, it almost feels as if Doyle had forgotten to mention this. And it just, <laughs> oh, by the way, because it then fits into the plot at that point, because this is kind of the tacked on bit. Yeah. I think that's right because this is where he's 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 decided that actually he's now going to tell a spiritualist tale and he didn't have it set up in the earlier part of the story but now mm. now he does. I mean the, the other thing that he brings into this story very early on is reincarnation. Yes, and that features quite strongly um towards the 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 the, the, the close of the novel. Uh I talked earlier about um Fanny Craddock doing this Atlantean <laughs> romance uh, and the love story and we've actually got one of those in the Maricot Deep. Uh, where where Cyrus Headley falls in love with 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 Mona, the daughter of the the, the headman of Atlantis, uh, Manda. Mm. It's it's almost a very similar scenario to um, to, to a scene in, in the Coming Race uh, by Bulwer Lytton, but mm. here it's 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 a it's a bit more sentimental. But there's one point where where you get this this statement from uh, from Headley. Yes, I, Cyrus Headley, now of New York and of Oxford. I, the latest product of modern culture, had myself once been part of this mighty civilization of old. I understood now why many of the symbols and hieroglyphs which I had seen around me had impressed me with a vague familiarity. Again and again, I had felt like a man who strains his memory because he feels that he is on the edge of some great mm. discovery which is always awaiting him, and yet is always just outside his grasp. Now, too, I understood that deep soul thrill which I had encountered when my eyes met those of Mona. They came from the depths of my own subconscious self, where the memories of 12,000 years still lingered. So here we find out that, that, that Cyrus Headley is actually a reincarnated Atlantean. Mm-hmm. Um, th- th- this, as, as you mentioned, Mark, this has got something to do with, with uh, Conan Doyle's interest in, in theosophy and, and in Buddhism uh, yes. and, and certain Eastern es- esoteric ideas. But it's also again influenced by contemporary literature mm. um the, this is it's very close this, this idea to um the reincarnation that lies at the heart of of uh, rider haggard's she yes uh, yeah. published in 1886 in which the, the the hero leo vinci we later discover is is a reincarnation of of, of aisha's beloved calicrates um, and the idea reemerges in Bram Stoker's *The Jewel of Seven Stars*, uh, yeah. published in 1903, and *Fra the Phoenician*, um, which appeared between 1890 and 1991 um, by Edwin Lester Arnold, uh, 
Edwin Lester Arnold, interesting, was the son of Edwin Arnold, uh, who wrote the great epic uh, Buddhist poem, The Light of Asia, uh, yeah. with which Doyle was doubtless familiar. Mm. Um, and then shortly after the Maricot Deep, uh, A.E.W. Mason um, wrote a, a novel uh, on the theme of reincarnation called The Three Gentlemen, uh, was published in 1932. Uh, and of course, Conan Doyle himself had also written a short story on the theme of reincarnation called Through the Veil vale, uh, mm-hmm. in 1911, in which um, a Scottish couple realised that they had, had lived previously in Roman times. Yeah, it's interesting you should mention that one because there's a line in the Maricot Deep which which I think is quite closely related to a line near the end of Through the Veil, vale, which is... Um, it's a moment where, again, Headley is talking about this experience of being reincarnated. He says, we had for a moment seen a corner lifted in the great dark veil of nature and had one passing gleam of truth amid the mysteries which surround us. And then the, it goes on to this next sentence, which is clearly Conan Doyle speaking and not Headley, which is, each life is but one chapter in a story which God has designed. You cannot judge its wisdom or its justice until in some supreme day from some pinnacle of knowledge, you look back and see at last the cause and the effect acting and reacting down all the long chronicles of time. And this this whole idea of, of, of reincarnation it also ties in with, with, with the ideas that Conan Doyle held about um, you know, don't, don't, it, it, the spiritualist ideas that, that death is nothing to be afraid of. Mm. It, it's simply the doorway to the next world, or you know, in the case of reincarnation, to the next life. Um, and there's there's a uh, an interesting speculation um, when when the explorers find Atlantis, um, and, and the, there's the comment made: you know, if we were dead to the world, we had at least found a life beyond, which promised some compensation for what mm. we had lost. So their, their new life in Atlantis is, is that replacement for the old, you know, the, the, the rat race world that they'd got out of on the, on the surface. Mm. Um, and and there's, there's, there's a later, almost a strange reinforcement to this when they meet Baal Sipa, mm. who is this great immortal creature. And, and he actually says to them, O oh, mortals, never pray to be delivered from death. It may seem terrible, but eternal life is infinitely more so. Mm. So once more, Conan Doyle is, is, is putting the spiritualist message into his fiction. Yes, and he's talking there about the, the curse of immortality. Uh, and it goes <clears> back to something we were talking about with the creeping man, this idea that those who, can, those who would have the power to um, uh, set themselves up above nature and cheat <clears> death are probably the people least deserving uh, <clears> of, of that. And the ending of the, the story is, um, is really about... Um, the spiritual ascending over the the materialistic, um, the limits of material knowledge. There's a, a sentence in there about uh, you know soon we have, soon we were to have proof that in spiritual culture there was a vast chasm which separated them from us. The lesson which we carry from their rise and their fall is that the greatest danger which may come to a state is when its intellect outruns its soul. It destroyed this old civilization and it may yet be the ruin of our own. Um, and uh, and Maricot's what happens at the end is Maricot gets possessed by this ancient good. What in in Blavatsky's term it would be a Lord of the Dazzling Face, mm. this sort of white magic. Um, and essentially, you have this kind of Star Trek Doctor Who ending where um, the 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 hero of the piece, in this case Maricot, possessed by a uh, a deity, uh, essentially talks <laughs> talks. Um, the Lord of the Dark Face out of it. I mean, there's a wonderful moment where um, Baal Sipa then sort of descends into this dark, formless mass. He's sort of into this semi-liquid heap of black and horrible putrescence um, and dissolves like the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> but but actually what's happening is that um, Maricot's um, materialism has proved to be absolutely worthless in the face of this ancient evil. Uh, so... Um, they say that uh, the, the Headley and Scanlon put their faith in Maricot. If any human brain could solve our difficulties, it would be his. And yet surely we had reached a point which was beyond all human capacity. We were as helpless as children in the face of forces which we could neither understand nor control. Um, and then once um, uh, uh, it, it transpires that Maricot prayed, and that's how he, he was 
Mm. You know, he saw this deity and how he was able to channel this deity effectively. It says that it should have happened to me, he cried, to me, a materialist, a man so immersed in matter that the invisible did not exist in my philosophy. The theories of a whole lifetime have crumbled about my ears. You know, this is the ultimate defeat of this great scientific rationalist, Maricot. Um, and, uh, you know, Conan Doyle's, Conan Doyle is not subtle at this time of his life, but but it, this is absolutely uh, hitting this one on the head here. He's making it absolutely clear what he's thinking. And, it, and again, it ties into what we've spoken about earlier with... Um, his criticism of scientific orthodoxy and, and, and scientific thinking. Uh, and it's interesting that from the wording, you have got materialism and evil mm. both defeated together at the same time. Oh, yes. Good point. And that's a good point on which to look back over the whole course of the Maricot Deep. So how did you feel about this one, Paul, when you got to the end of the Maricot Deep? Well, it's, it was great to go back to it uh, in 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 many ways because it, it it's it rounds off his career nicely in in many ways because you look at his his first completed novel, The Firm of Girdleston, mm. which is very much almost in places a, a Dickens pastiche yes. where he's looking backwards in his writing, and then by the Maricot Deep, as you say, he's trying to be contemporary. He's trying to be nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties popular fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas we know the height of his fiction is is, is late Victorian Edwardian is is where a lot of it's really at, at, at the peak, but he's still trying to still trying to remain relevant yeah. in that world. And yeah, it it, it it is it, it's it's great to explore that. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of the Maricot Deep. If you'd like to find out more about the episode, then you can find the show notes at doingsofdoyle.com. dot com. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, then please leave us a rating or review on your podcaster of choice. Um, or consider becoming a patron on Patreon. And what's on the podcast next time, Paul? Next time we'll be in discussion with uh, Dr. Stephen Carver, uh, one of the recipients of the inaugural Doylean Honours this January for his blog on Professor Challenger. Professor Challenger, who's come up several times this episode. So mm. thank you very much uh, for listening, and uh, we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. In the centre I have a brandy shaped glass into the neck of which I've put all my prawns in a little ring all the way round and then I have um, crayfish here and brown shrimps, cockles and what else? Only this rather extravagant lobster but that is only a small one and needn't be used on very many occasions.